you mentioned to me briefly, and I have to bring it back up because it was it sounded funny, it sounded hilarious. But tell me about tell me about the marijuana tenants and, and some of these deals you worked on early on in your career. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Today we have Eric e. Gelko on the CRE Arena, and I uh, just want to thank everybody for coming and tuning in, whether that's on a, a podcast or a, a YouTube platform or that's Spotify. However, you're listening, I uh, really just appreciate you all spending your time with us here today. Uh, and we have Eric. Man, Eric, thank you so much for being here. Augie, thank you for having me, man. This is uh, certainly way overdue. Yeah, no, it, 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 it is. And Eric and I have spent some good time in, in uh, crazy places. I guess that's a weird way to say it. But um, but yeah, we spent some time in, uh, in in Hawaii together. And then I, I guess you weren't actually at, uh, you weren't in um, California with us uh, in Napa because the baby, right? You just had a... Pretty much like the within like a week of the trip the baby was due so, so i remember that that was yeah so that was the first time i actually saw a picture of the baby was tony yusuf we were like getting coffee at the little coffee shop one morning and he's like dude check this out like eric just had the baby uh and tony was so pumped up about it man that's 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 how you know you got good teammates and good people in your corner um so uh well, well cool man well thanks for coming on and and for everybody listening that doesn't know eric um eric was a senior advisor with svn out on the west coast in california and still in the west coast in california but he's uh, recently switched roles uh so still crushing commercial real estate uh but just recently became the owner founder uh ceo janitor marketing guy everything of uh Egelco enterprises so man, that's that's incredibly exciting. So um, we'll we'll get into that here in a little bit. But uh, man, I think first and foremost, Eric, if you could just kind of you know tell us like how you got to where you are today. You know whether it's starting out from childhood, uh, wherever you feel comfortable starting at is, uh, you know how did you get to where you are today? Awesome. Well, yeah. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast, Augie. It, it, it's a, it's an honor and a privilege. Um, you know, watching you through through your journey has been super inspirational, as I'm sure Appreciate that. A, a lot of the followers feel as well. So, um, I would say my story is pretty conventional. Um, I grew up in, in like uh, Central Coast, California, in a town called Ventura. Um, parents are still married, but been, been together my whole life. Uh, uh, spent my whole life in the same childhood home. Uh, my dad was a real estate investor and ran a, uh, a debt fund uh, doing private money lending for about 30 years. Um, so he never really filled me in much about what he was doing as a kid. I just knew that this guy had a lot of free time um, and got to be super involved in, in athletics and sort of anything we had going on as kids. So I sort of always had it in the back of my head that, that uh, you know, whatever he's doing is it, creating a pretty good lifestyle. So yeah. and, um, real estate was not my, my first pursuit. I, I went to college at uh, San Francisco State. Uh, and when I started, I intended to be an attorney. Um, I took one political science class and immediately switched my major. Um, yeah. and, well, it was not a good fit for me. I, I had asked the teacher, uh, how it is that the government can just uh, lose money every year and do that in perpetuity. And then they yeah. pretty much said that's just how it is. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a math guy and that just didn't sit right with me. So uh, switched yeah. to business, um, got a pretty good exposure to the tech scene up in San Francisco, um, kind of ran the gamut of different sales jobs. Um, I, I felt like it was sort of like a, a slum dog millionaire type of come up in sales just because I had pretty much every single annoying sales job you can think of from, yeah. you know, one of those guys on the sidewalk with the clipboard trying to get you to donate money to, to save the rainforest to, to uh, handing out samples in the grocery store to, uh, you know, cold calling people for, for, for different companies. And it yeah. was, uh, you know, I, I sort of just learned early on that I have this incredible uh, resilience for, for rejection. Uh, and that it would almost be a game for me, you know, how uh, how uncomfortable can I make this? Yeah. Um, so uh, 
finished college. Um, San Francisco it was crazy expensive uh, at the time and still is now, but uh, I was visiting a friend down in San Diego for New Year's and he had this great apartment with a pool and parties and good weather and all this stuff and, and I asked him what he was paying and uh, I was paying the same amount to rent a room in like an old house that, that was gross as he was paying for an entire apartment with a pool and all this stuff and uh, I had just finished college so I didn't really know what I was doing so just sort of impulsively decided to move down to San Diego. Uh, wow. Been here ever since uh, and don't plan on leaving anytime soon. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome, man. Um that's that's crazy i didn't know that so i didn't know um i don't know about all, all your childhood i guess but that's uh even serving out samples in the in the grocery store that's pretty funny my kids call those little restaurants when those people are <laughs> set up in the in the grocery store but um so with you and, and you say with your dad so was he doing was he doing more commercial real estate or was he doing residential real estate yeah, or? So he um he yeah, started yeah. as a broker he, he was doing apartments um and then found a niche selling uh, motels uh he sold a fair amount of motels in the 80s and 90s um, and then, uh, after a while, uh, you know, brokerage is, is not a forever job. So he, yeah. he made the jump from that and started pooling capital and making private loans and, and did that for about 30 years. Yeah. Um, and, and that's cool, man. So when, whenever you were a kid, I know you said like, you weren't too like in the know with like, Hey, what dad was doing. You just know that he like, you know, made pretty good money and then could also go to all your sporting events and things like that. So that's obviously attractive uh, as a young man, but do you think uh, like when you were, when you were uh, being raised, do you wish like you would have been in the office more, been like more exposed to like the, like the business side of things with your dad? Or do you think it was like when you're 12, 13, you're just like, Hey, I don't want to hear about it. Or like, you know, I, I was a pretty angsty teenager, so I don't know that, that I was even prepared to, to receive the information at that time. Yeah, um, you know, a, a lot. Oftentimes, I'll think, you know, do I wish things would have gone differently? And, and the conclusion I come to every time is that everything that happened led me to where I'm at now, which is a position that I'm super happy with. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, and and yeah, that's that's what matters, man. That's that's exciting uh, because that's one thing I think of for you know me having kids. It's like, hey, I have a you know eight year old eight-year-old boy and a six-year-old girl and then a little tiny baby boy but you know my eight-year-old like he wants to do real estate and talk about like building things and you know uh we talk about buildings we talk about all these things so you know how involved to have them um i think yeah like when you own commercial real estate you know like having them go around and pick up the trash and understand the concept of um you know landlords and tenants and ownership and renting and even mortgages and things like that, uh, just to start to expose them to that stuff. If they'll listen, um, it's a, it's a shorter attention span. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a shorter attention span you have with a younger kid, but, um, yeah, that's one thing that I've personally thought of and selfishly asked the question, uh, as a, as a, a fellow dad growing up in, you know, commercial real estate. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I can say uh, one thing that my parents always pushed on me was entrepreneurship and, and, and sort of ownership of whatever you're doing. And, and I think that kind of influence as a child and as a teenager is just invaluable because it, it's kind of it takes this sort of awakening to get out of the matrix of thinking, oh, you know, I'm going to go to school, I'm going to go to grad school, I'm going to get a good job, I'm going to grind it out for 40 years, get a gold watch, at some point I'll have fun. Yeah. Um, and, and that, uh, you know, for, for, from a super young age, it just didn't seem, you know, I, I, I thought I was too smart for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, and, that, and that's, uh, that's cool for your parents to instill that in you. Um, that, yeah, that's something I, I, I don't take for granted either. My dad was, uh, he, he sold insurance and had his own insurance agency when I was being raised. And I remember like being in the office and, uh, dude, I remember, you know, this is all, you know, there's still direct mail and commercial real estate, but, um, a lot of people aren't doing much direct mail anymore, but, uh, I remember my dad was sending out envelopes of some sort, but like, man, I would go to go after school and just lick envelopes. And like whenever he would do a big mailer, like once a month or once a quarter and like, oh, dude, I don't know if they didn't have the mighty invention of like the, the water, you know, like the auto liquor. I don't know what you'd say, what, what you'd call it, but like, you know, the little tool where you just wet the envelope, but I was just licking these envelopes as a kid. And like, 
I would just taste glue for days because I would, my dad would have me licking envelopes by the, you know, two, three, four hundred, um, to the point where you're just like, dad, like my tongue's dry and like, I can't do this anymore. So, um, that's the, that, those are the fun things that like, I remember growing up as a kid. Um, so it's cool to see that your, your, your parents have instilled a similar, like, Hey, the entrepreneurship or entrepreneurial, um, you know, ventures like that is, there's a lot of fun in that. There's a lot of freedom and, uh, a lot of work, but there's a lot of freedom in it as well. So, uh, if you can persevere through, so, uh, so getting into real estate for you. So you moved down to, uh, to, to San Diego for the cheap rent and the pretty girls. And then, you know, what after that was, was, yes. was, was the venture into real estate? Yeah. So I had, I moved down here and, and I had like a little, uh, web design, internet marketing business. And it was, you know, I wasn't making the big bucks, but, but it was a pretty good lifestyle. I got to say that I worked for myself. Um, however, the one thing that was kind of a grind about it is on these projects, you get your initial 50% payment, then you do the work and, and then you get the balance. And I always found that collecting on that second half of the payment on these online marketing and web design jobs, was a huge nuisance and people were always trying to, to stretch out the project and you're like in, in this disadvantaged position where yeah. in real estate by the time the broker gets paid their obligation is done but like yeah. they will not be paid until no more is expected from them um and, and that format just really was attractive to me so i, I um got my real estate license uh didn't really have a plan, um, but just knew that I was going to apply maximum effort and, and would see what happened. Um, so I had applied to a couple different firms and really no one w was taking me seriously. So I ended up just going to work for like a two-man band brokerage um, that did uh, leasing and tenant rep mostly, which I had thought I was going to sell apartments or shopping centers. I, I didn't even know anything about representing tenants. So yeah. uh, I, I spent nine months grinding it out as a tenant rep broker. Um, I think I wrote like 75 LOIs and wow. made less than 10 deals uh, in, in those first nine months. So it, it was, I, I joke that, that I know hundreds of ways to not close the deal. Yeah, um, right. So I um, was worked with those guys. Uh, it was not really quite, quite a culture fit. Uh, you know, there's sort of this ecosystem of brokers just taking in new people, grinding them out and, you know, continually turning over agents. Yeah. And um, I, I was very fortunate on one of the deals I was working, um, the listing broker was an SVN broker. And, and I put a proposal in on this property and I followed up with this guy relentlessly. I'd call him every morning at 8.30 in the morning. I'd call him every afternoon at 4.30 in the afternoon uh, just to say, you know, you got an update for me on our deal. And mm -hmm. after about three days of doing this, uh, he, he was getting pretty perturbed. Um, but he, he mentioned to me that, you know, if you're going to be working this hard, you might as well come to a real company. Um, mm -hmm. And that uh, was sort of my foray into SBN. Wow. Um... No, and then so when you got when you when you got your foot in the door with SVN, I think you just I assume you noticed that they were just playing at a higher level, and it was more of an environment that you that you could thrive in. I assume. Yeah, I mean it was just more of a real company. You know, they had a nice office. That there were other people in the office. That there was sort of this buzz going on. So it, it just seemed that you need that, and, and that the more context you can create for yourself, the, the quicker you'll grow your business. Yeah. No, for sure. Uh, so with you, with you going to SVN, uh, so how long were you with the other company before you went to SVN? Like how long were you in the business? So, yeah. So I, I was about nine months in at the time I made the switch, um, which made for sort of a, an interesting dynamic because I had not quite enough experience to, to be like a standalone broker, but yeah. I knew enough that, that I didn't want to just be kicking up money upstairs unnecessarily. Um, so I made sort of the stubborn decision that um, I'm not going to have any kind of a senior broker and, and that, you know, succeed or fail, I'm just going to do it on my own and, and you know, yeah. give myself the opportunity to reap the maximum reward and uh, yeah. 
the managing director at the firm what was kind of had a blase attitude about new agents. So he, he was sort of just bringing on uh, anyone with, with a lot of ambition. So they went for it. And uh, yeah, no, that's, that's awesome, man. So, and, and yeah, that's kind of how I started as well in the business. Similar, I had the similar, you know, attitude going in of just kind of going for it. Um, I didn't really partner up with anybody too much at, at, at uh, you know, deals to get started, but definitely had some good mentors and people around me that were, that were cheering in my corner, but kind of like you said, you know, mainly just paid attention to the people that are like doing well, like, you know, cause when you go in there and you don't know what to do and, and what you're doing, it's kind of like, all right, who's, who in here is making a lot of money, you know? And, and like, okay, I know these guys are making a lot of money. I see the leaderboard and it's like, okay, what are they doing? You know? And I looked at what they did and like, all right, I'm just going to do what they do. Uh, so, you know, that's what I did. And, and, and things turned out pretty well. So with you, so did you immediately, like when you got there and, and did you like, uh, did you have a niche of like property type when you got in of like, Hey, did you always say that you were going to do like retail shopping centers or were you uh, more apartment? No, yeah. Like no, I, I am. And perhaps I, I should have specialized earlier on, but, but I was pretty agnostic just because you get a lead and you're, you're hungry for, for, for business and, and you work on it. So I, I kind of done a, a, a plethora of everything. I, I bounced back and forth between doing leasing and doing multifamily sales. And uh, what, what I sort of learned through doing lots of different deals is, is that it's all different flavors of the same recipe. If that makes sense that, that, that uh, uh, you know, everyone's posturing, you got to, anticipate people's objections and problems and that the the type of real estate really is just the medium that, that you're transacting. So whether it's an apartment building or a shopping center, um, the characters and the players are pretty much the same. Yeah. Uh, and, and now I, I know what you mean by that. So I did uh, specialize in like niche down first, but you know, I, I was like the, I wanted to be uh, the apartment guy. I wanted to go sell apartments and, you know, it's pretty funny because it's like, all right, I'm going to specialize in apartments and database them and start calling on them. And that's what I did. But as soon as like that restaurant tenant rep, you know, opportunity came available or that small like landscaping company that needs like 2000 square feet, I'm like, I'll take it. Yeah. Like, no, I do that. I'll, I'll do it. It's like anything you can do to like get a paycheck and stay in the business is kind of just what you got to do. So, um, well, that's great, man. And then for for you to start to have, like, when would you say in your uh, brokerage careers when you started to, like, see real success? Um, well, I, I would say there was a couple inflection points. Um, I would say until I was about 18 months in, I didn't feel like I had experienced any success. And, yeah. and then at about 18 months in, I, I got hyper-focused on my geography. Um, and, and I basically... Uh, there's a section uh, in San Diego called University Ave. That it's like one of the main thoroughfares that, that cuts through the whole town. And uh, I went out to, to a part of West La Mesa that, that's a pretty crappy portion of University Ave. And, and I just walked the streets for, from the 7200 University to 7400 University and talked to every single owner. And I, I basically became the number one broker of those two blocks. Yeah, um, and, and that I, I had like three different listings in that that little pocket right there, and, and all of a sudden I started experiencing synergy. That like a tenant would call for one space, and I actually have three different spaces available on this street, so that suddenly I'm moving the chess pieces around and, and doing deals got a lot easier. So yeah. at about eighteen months in, I, I got really focused on my geography, and, and I started only working on getting listings. So I, I would say that was like the initial inflection point. And then um, about three years in, uh, maybe a little over three years in, um, I had a junior agent and, and the two of us sort of stumbled backwards into the, this $5 million shopping center transaction. Wow. Um, and, and it was like, uh, it was very much out of our wheelhouse. Neither of us had done anything that big before. And I'm supposed to be like the senior person who knows what he's doing. And, and it was, uh, it was a wild ride of a deal. It, it was super stressful. We had, uh, dumping rain the day of the inspection. 
Um, so. Which, if, if you're a seller's agent at an inspection, you're hoping everything goes perfectly and there's no problems with the property. Yeah. So, so having dumping rain, especially that this was an older property that had been a bit neglected, uh, yeah. w w was sort of running us through the gambit. And then um, in the middle of the escrow, a, uh, a predatory plaintiff filed an ADA lawsuit against the property. Oh. Um, in the middle of the escrow. So we, yeah. we had to negotiate and settle that expeditiously. And it was, I think the whole transaction start to finish was like seven or eight months. And it was like seven or eight months of like, first thing I think of in the morning, 6 a.m., stressed out about this deal. Last thing I think about when I go to bed, stressed out yeah. about this deal. But we, uh, you know, we, we closed it. Uh, we, we didn't make a, a huge amount of money just because we kind of got attacked from all angles on the fee. But it was it was like a resume piece that really put me on the map um, in yeah. terms of someone my age and my experience level knocking down a deal like that. Um, and then I, I would say that is when things started snowballing and I started getting a lot more of these bigger deals. Yeah, no, that's and, and so I want to get I want to get into those bigger deals and how you did those bigger deals. But you mentioned to me briefly, and I have to bring it back up because it was it sounded funny. It sounded hilarious. But tell me about tell me about the marijuana tenants and, and some of these deals you worked on early on in your career. Yeah, so, so I, I got started in real estate in, in the end of 2015. And then in 2016, 2017, there was just a huge wave of uh, marijuana businesses and California. And basically what these operators figured out is that they were making so much money um, running unlicensed pot shops that the, the penalties uh, for, for operating illegally were sort of just part of your business plan. So, so yeah. these people would, would take a building that should rent for like 2000 bucks a month and they'd rent it for 10,000 bucks a month. And if they can stay open for three to six months in this location, they'll make tons and tons of money. And what would end up happening is eventually the pot shops would get busted and the cities would file suit against the property owner and there would be a ton of pressure uh, to do something with the property. So I, uh, in this same section of West La Mesa that I was already working, there was tons of these. There, there was like in like one area of the street, there was like seven or eight of them. And so I would just keep track of all of them. And when I would find out that they had been busted, the very next day I'd call the property owner and say, you know, just by happenstance, I want to reach out to see if you want to sell your property. <laughs> and a property owner who's just had their illegal pot shop tenant get busted is perhaps the most motivated lead uh, yeah. you can ever get. So it... Um, I got connected with, with an attorney who, who worked in a lot of these type of matters and uh, ended up selling like four or five former illegal pot shops uh, in like a two year period at the beginning of my career. That's, that's funny, man. Um, yeah. People. Uh, so, and so why so many questions there? Why, um, you know, when, when these pot tenants got kicked out or so like the landlord would get slapped with these fines, I assume for signing the tenant. Um, so was it just like the fines were just, you know, crazy or was it you, like, you, yeah, you you know, what happened is, is the city w w would file a lawsuit and cloud the title on the property, which mm -hmm. as soon as you have a cloud on title, uh, you can't refinance. Um, you can't sell to anyone unless you sort out this lawsuit situation. And, and usually what would happen is the cities would come in with like a huge ass. They'd say, oh, you know, we want uh, $500,000 in fines. And, and we, this attorney would go back and say, look, we'll give you 40000 in fines and we'll agree to sell the property you know, to a new owner yeah. And, yeah. and that it was, um, it was kind of like a whack-a-mole situation. It would be super fine. These places would get busted and they'd literally just move directly across the street. And because they had changed addresses, the the city attorney's process has to start over. So, so they yeah. get another six months of, of operating this business. So, yeah. And, and, um, yeah, funny times not happening anymore. That's yeah. And that's crazy, man. I remember like, now in like today's world it's so normalized like you know it's, it's so normalized in today's market but i remember like or probably around that time when i was a kid and, and you know seeing or when i was uh, a younger kid i was just like i would i would see the 
like these these pot shops going up with like pictures of them you know like you'd have somebody go visit from california and like you're in high school or whatever and you see somebody go visit california and like send you pictures of like these big like you know a store with a pot leaf on it and it's just like what like they're selling weed in there like they're selling marijuana out of these stores like it was just a mind-blowing thing like whenever it first came out but nowadays it's like they're on almost every corner um at least like you know for most for most uh states where i mean where it's recreational for sure but uh like even even florida i believe we're still only medicinal here and it's like um you know they're, they're still on every block it seems like you know there's there's a lot of stores but i mean what 10 years ago it was just like it was still very very taboo you know um but that's a heck of a way to get some deals done man whatever you got to do to fill the pipeline yeah uh, you know i um i so, i sort of struggle with anything that i feel is inefficient and, and yeah. kind of conventional means of prospecting of, of just making a ton of calls and, and doing all that stuff it, it, it wasn't that i didn't have the energy to do it i i just it sort of pained me inside to do something that was inefficient. So I, I sort of with that opportunity and throughout my career, I, I've just focused on identifying motivation. And it's, you know, sort of the broker's role is to to find the motivated seller at the end of the day. Yeah, no, taking and that's that's one thing is, man, taking the warm slash hot shots is because that's what everybody talks about is cold calls. Um, and those are great. Those definitely work. But like you want to make warm calls or hot, like we call them hot shots. Like you want to take those hotter, warmer shots um, because, you know, if you take if you make 100 cold calls, like you'll get the same results as if you make, you know, five, five or six like hot shots or warm calls. So I uh, completely agree with you there. So and and I mean, for your for your brokerage career. Uh, so when when you know from that five million dollar shopping center uh man i've seen multiple deals you've knocked down for like 10 12 15 18 million you know like good size like eight figure deals so how did you kind of continue to climb the ranks of like you know selling those type of assets and like those type of values yeah i um i i had a really fortunate break that that a um i got a leasing lead for a shopping center here in la mesa that um, I did a great job. It was there was a uh, a nine thousand square foot space that had a school that the school had lost their charter, so they, they couldn't uh -huh. operate anymore. And uh, I found another school that that had their building had just been sold, so they needed to move. So it's kind of uh -huh. all of a sudden I have two super motivated parties. So I was able to uh, to plug the new school into the space, and, and the landlord was blown away by this because yeah. they had thought it was going to be such a difficult space to fill and I got them, you know, the perfect tenant right away, super high rent. And I, I was basically just their guy from that point. And that yeah. same client, um, about a year and a half later, decided to sell that property um, and gave me the listing, which at that time, I was not quite the pedigree of the kind of broker who, who'd be getting those listings. And uh, I did a great job selling that one. They had another property up in Temecula um, that I ended up selling for eight and a half million. The, the first one was 6.8, then eight and a half. And, and through doing those deals and having the listing, you just get, you basically, you get in touch with the type of leads that you'll never get from cold calling. That, yeah. that just having an attractive listing and, and sort of the higher end of the price category, all of a sudden you start getting just gold pouring in on the phone. So through through doing those two deals, I, I got connected with some people who, who were really big time investors, like, like a huge portfolio, were transacting a lot. And just jumped on the opportunity, did some deals with them, got connected to some more people in a similar space. And uh, what I realized is that the most competitive segment of brokerage is actually for small deals. That 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 is it's sort of counterintuitive in a way that people think, oh, you know, I'm just going to go for the smaller stuff because it'll be easier to get it. Whereas every single agent uh, who has less than five years experience is competing for the smaller stuff. And all yeah. of a sudden, when, when I got into the, you know, 8 million, 10 million, 15 million, it, it was, I mean, at least in, in my region here in California, there, there's maybe like four or five teams that, that are like heavy hitters going for these type of deals. 
And I was the only person who, who was like a, like a lone ranger trying to knock down these deals. And, and I yeah. think that I was able to use that to my advantage um, in a sense that, that I would tell prospective clients that, uh, you know, I don't need four people to close this deal. I'm a one man army. Here's all the deals right. that closed. And, it, you know, people who own commercial real estate like hard chargers, you, you know, yeah. someone who, who's audacious and a little bit cocky um, is yeah. who you want for a broker. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's. I think COVID helped a lot. Um, that there was just a, a huge spike in transactional velocity in 2021, and, and I, I got to capitalize on that. Um, yeah. No, that's that's great, man. And that's yeah. We uh, we have a, a more similar story than we thought. Um, that's a. Uh, it makes a lot of sense of what you're saying with. Uh, you know, like being the the um, tenacious young broker, because I mean, a lot of what I've learned and very similar perspective to you is like a lot of these people that own 10, 15 million dollar uh, uh, properties, they they a, a lot of times like see if you're a young, hungry broker that's calling them and like providing them value, not like having commission breath and not being sleazy about it, but like trying to provide them value, however you can leasing, whatever it is. Uh, and build that relationship with them then and like you're out there like cold calling them uh you know a lot of them respect that you know to a great deal like i've picked up listings before where like some of the first things like the guys will say to me is like man i appreciate the hustle like oh i love the hustle i love that you just called me from this um and then also you know similar similar strategy of like, Hey, whenever you're selling a property, you have that $8 million listing. And then, you know, you call the, the $12 million guy and you're like, Hey man, I have this like shopping center in Temecula. Like, you know, we're about to take it to market or we just took it to market. I want to put it in front of you. You know, I see you're a you know, property owner in the area. Uh, a lot of times, like, you know, brokers, even on big teams or small teams, I don't want to categorize them too much, but like, uh, just to have the tenacity to like, when you have a listing to actually go out and hunt for buyers, because I've, you know, I've heard people tell me before, like, man, you know, okay, you're selling this. Like, you know, a lot of brokers just put up a sign or put it on one of the listing websites and then like they're done with it. Uh, then they go find a buyer and it sells. But if you're out there like talking to other property owners in their mind, what they think is like, man, whenever I go to sell my property, like I want to hire a broker that's out there pounding the phones to like call other property owners, you know? So um, I think that's one thing that I've gotten respect from before and which I think like us younger, younger guys and like the younger people that are aggressive can use to their advantage. Um, you know, they can really use that to their advantage rather than it being a hindrance because, you know, in our minds, it's like, oh man, we're younger. You know, we haven't made the, you know, earlier on in your career, you're just like, you haven't made the big name for yourself. You don't have the pedigree, but it's like, man, I've got hustle. I've got work ethic, you know? And, um, and then you can use that to your advantage where people want to do deals with, with brokers like that. So, um, yeah. And, and I think early on in your career, you, you see a lot of people who are more established and, and you have kind of like this, uh, mythology about them that, that you think that they're on this incredible level that, that you're so far away from. And, and then you start knocking down a couple deals, you meet a couple of these people in person and, and you realize they're all human. Yeah. You know, and you meet some of these owners and, you know, someone who has a hundred million in assets, you sit down with them at Starbucks and, and they're just an ordinary person. And I think that, that there's a lot of, uh, psyching yourself out uh, about knocking down bigger deals that, that younger brokers try to stray away from it because they, they just yeah. think it's a bad idea. When, when I would say it's the, there's, there's less competition and there's not less work, but the work is way more worth it in, in terms of, of how lucrative it is. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I a hundred percent agree there. And then also like I've noticed like, each transaction has its things like there's work to do in every transaction. But I remember the first deal that I did that was bigger. It was like 7 million. Um, I've done like, you know, $500,000 deals and like in, in million dollar deals, $2 million deals at this point. But like the, the amount of like, say call it brain damage, but the amount of like 
you know, work that is like unnecessary or people just like dealing with other people that like don't have their stuff together. They're not approved for financing all their records and P and L's and rent roll is all like done on a napkin. Uh, you know, so like going from like the smaller transactions, you're going to find more people that like, um, that don't have their stuff together versus the assets that are like, you know, five, seven, 10 million. It's like, man, these people have, they have CPAs, they have attorneys, they have their bankers lined up. They have like, they have everybody lined up all the vendors and contractors and management companies and, and all those things. And it's just, it's pretty streamlined. And like everybody is kind of playing at the top of their game where you can really run efficiently as a broker then, and not so much do like, all right, let me be your CPA and dig through your like tax records. Let me try and like put together your rent roll for you. Um, you know, stuff like that. So um, that's, that's, that's big on the, on the bigger deals, I think. So, uh, man with, uh, I want to shift gears here a little bit and, you know, talk about, you know, you, you branching out now and, uh, and, you know, oh, I guess even before then, because you started buying deals for yourself before you, uh, uh, branched out. So, you know, what was the first deal that you bought? When did you do that in your career? What was that deal? How did it go? How do you, where'd you find it? How'd you structure it? You know, if you could tell us more about that, that'd be awesome. Yes. So it's, um, the, the first deal I bought that was like strictly an investment deal was a, a four bedroom townhome here in La Mesa, which is the first city east of San Diego, which is where I live. Um, it was, uh, uh an older woman, um, had moved into assisted living and the house was vacant and, and the kids needed to sell it. Um, they listed on the MLS um, with an agent who did not do a very good job with the marketing. Um, I would say that that's been sort of a secret for me finding deals um, is if you see those cell phone pictures with, you know, and the, the house is dirty and nothing is framed correctly, uh, that there is gold and, and that kind of yeah. stuff. So yeah. they had, um, they had put it on for four ninety nine. dollars um, I called the agent immediately, met him there in person. Um, I, I found if you really want to lock down a deal, you got to do it in person. That, that, that yeah. is, anyone can tell you anything you want to hear on the phone, but, but in person is it, where deals get done. So yeah, yeah. we met him in person. Um, I gassed the agent up on the whole, you know, you can be our agent, you can be the seller's agent, and the, which surprisingly this is like a foreign concept for, for most realtors, the, the idea. Whereas, you know, commercial real estate, if possible, we want to double on the deal. Realtors yeah. will go 20 years with, without even realizing you can do that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we ended up going under contract at 465, um, did our inspections. Um, the, it, was, it was a screaming deal. It would have been a three even deal at four ninety nine. Um, we struggled to get the financing. Um, it was I, I had had like one good year in the business at that point, and, and most lenders want to see two years of that. So we knew it was such a good deal that that we just kept pushing through, and we were super fortunate that we found a private lender um, who was able to lend on it. So we, we closed it. Um, we did a super tacky renovation, um, pr probably the most <laughs> mediocre renovation uh, I've ever done. But we were we were on a shoestring budget. It, you know, we, we bought like the, the, the cheapest carpet Home Depot had and we painted the cabinets instead of replacing them. And um, I, for some time, had been doing research into Section 8 uh, housing. Um, there's a lot of anti-landlord uh, sentiment uh, and rent control and this kind of stuff in California, as I'm yeah. sure a lot of people talk about. So the idea of having guaranteed rent um, and not having to deal with, with the market rate tenant was really appealing to me. Um, plus, in this specific zip code, the Section 8 rent was above the market rent. Um, so we we bought this thing for, for 460 um, and we rented it for 4,000 a month. Whoa. Yeah. So we were, wow. we, we were cranking. We, we had an interest only loan. So we, we were cash flowing about 2000 bucks a month on our very first deal. We, we, we felt like Kings, yeah. um, about six or seven months go by. Um, I get a notice from the HOA that that's basically like a warning violation that we are harboring a nuisance. Um, and, uh, I, I go over to the property and it was kind of like a, like a scene out of boys in the hood. 
um, that, that, that I, I had picked the wrong tenants and, and they started having lots of people over and that they're fixing cars in the common area and smoking and drinking and being hostile to the neighbors. And, and it really, you know, I, I, I had a situation on my hands. So yeah. fortunately um, here in San Diego, the waiting list to get a section eight voucher is over 10 years. Um, it, it's absolutely absurd. I, I don't know how the system can function with a 10 year waiting list, but because yeah. of that, as a Section 8 landlord, you, you totally have the upper hand, that, that the tenant does not want to do anything to risk losing that voucher. So I didn't hire an attorney. I, I just wrote him a letter myself basically explaining that, you know, I don't want to mess up your situation, but you got to leave. Like, this isn't going to work. Yeah. And um, without an attorney, I got the tenant out in less than 30 days. Um, so wow, that, that was a pretty big win. H however, we, we had really burnt out our relationship with the HOA. Um, yeah. So we decided it was just time to sell the property. Um, fortunately, we, we had bought it in 2021. We sold it in 2022. The market had boomed during that period because of the low interest rates. So we ended up selling it for 705 um, wow. in like less than a year. We bought it for 461, sold it for 705. Um, took that money, exchanged it, bought another condo in a different complex where we, will, we chose a better tenant this time, as well as yeah. we bought a commercial property uh, in Lemon Grove, a little two-tenant strip center that, that we had uh, come across in just our brokerage prospecting. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that, that was, uh, I guess, the, the first deal and then into the next deals. Yeah. No, that's that's awesome, man. So, so the first commercial deal you did, the two, the the, the small two unit shopping center, um, was that? Did you still use private money on that one? Or was it vacant when you bought it? Like, how, how did that? Go? Yeah, so, so it um, we used the same private money lender that we had used on the previous property, um, just because we had like a, I think a twenty four month loan that we paid off in eight months. So he was happy with the interest he was making and, and was ready to do another deal with us. So yeah. we we had found this thing off market. Um, it was out of town owner property had quite a bit of deferred maintenance and had in, incredibly low rents. I, I mean, it was like less than one dollar a square foot gross. Um, which, wow. you know, yeah. Southern California, the rent's a lot higher than that. So yeah. fortunately, uh, the tenants were on short-term leases. So, so we just, you know, made deals for them to get out. And then they were both cooperative with that. Um, we had to put a lot more money into the building than we thought. Um, yeah. it, it, it's, uh, it, it was definitely very humbling just because I had been transacting big commercial deals for, for years. And I, I was a bit of a hotshot. And then, then I buy this you know, tiny little commercial property. And I felt like I was yeah. totally in over my head. Um, but we, uh, you know, we, we coughed up the dough, you know, you, when, once you're that deep into a deal, you have no choice, but, but to just make the moves that you have to make. Yeah. Um, leased it up. We, we, we had a, uh, a massage tenant uh, move into the first half. Uh, we put up a bunch of money for TI to get them built out and in exchange they're paying uh, what I feel to be a very premium rent. Um, and then uh, we got a salon tenant to move in the other half. Um, we had renovated that unit on spec. Um, which I wish I had done that sooner. We, we sort of lollygagged for three or four months with, with, with the unit in bad shape, hoping we'd find a tenant who would fix it up, with, which, and, you know, 750 square foot tenants are not coughing up money to do their own build out. Yeah, um, yeah. We renovated it on spec and then we leased it like in less than two weeks after that. So wow. definitely a lesson learned that if you get these smaller retail spaces, you're just better off fixing them up. Uh, in speculation of getting a tenant, but we, we got the salon in there. And, and I think uh, on like a cap rate basis for a purchase plus what we've spent on, on renovations, we're at like a 10% cap rate on yeah. that property. So it, it's, uh, it's humming along for the time being, um, but a, a lot of lessons learned. And I would say that, yeah, commercial property ownership is definitely a much more advanced investment than residential properties. Yeah. 
And, and is that the way, so I mean, the way you're going to continue to go or use it, is it going to be more predominantly commercial uh, or you're still dabbling the residential opportunities? Like what's the strategy with the yeah. investments moving forward? Yeah, so I, I, I just bought a deal uh, about two weeks ago for, for a, a condo that, that was in distressed condition that, that we're going to renovate and lease. And I think moving forward, uh, at least for the time being, the bulk of the best investing is going to be in residential stuff. Um, it, it's, uh, it's a lot more predictable. Um, the problems are way smaller. And, and there seems to be uh, much more velocity in, in terms of like realizing your gain and you know refinancing and stuff like that. Whereas I, I see commercial properties more as like a yield play that, that once you have amounts of capital that, that are challenging to deploy into residential properties, then you buy something bigger, focus on your, your cash on cash returns. Whereas yeah, yeah r- r- right now we're, we're pretty much just targeting uh, small distressed residential properties. Yeah, there you go. Um, that's awesome, man. And and so for for you to go out on your own and and you know kind of make that jump, you know, was it? Would you say like it was as scary as you thought? Like, what were some of the things you, uh, you know, like that weren't as scary as you thought, or were like, hey, I didn't expect this, and this was a whole lot more scary? Or like, you know, kind of what was that transition like, and what were some of the expectations going in, and all, then also like the reality from that? Yeah, I mean, I definitely. You know, I had some butterflies in my stomach uh, uh, about, you know, going into upper management and, you know, telling them that I was going to depart. Um, yeah. I'll tell you, ha- having a kid, you-, you get a ton of clarity real quickly. Uh, and yeah. it was, you know, while I had been thinking about this for, for, for a little bit, you know, as soon as I had the kid, it was like within a week I, I went in and made the jump. And oh, really? it's, I-, I would say, I think my circumstance is a little different just because usually people will leave to start a brokerage company or, or to try to be a competitor to, to the company they used to work for. Whereas right now with the rental portfolio that I have, it, it pretty much floats the boat in, in terms of covering my, my monthly expenses. Um, so I, I'm, I'm focusing now mostly on, you know, being a father, um, continuing to buy good deals. Um, ha- however, I think like the bulk of my brokerage uh, is behind me at this point. Yeah. Um, so it, it was not scary in that that sense that, that I have a pretty good safety net with, with these rental properties. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's cool, man. And, uh, yeah, having, having kids will make you, um, will make you act, uh, act fast, act certain. And ultimately like there's a much bigger responsibility in your life now. So, um, it's kind of like, hey, man, it's 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 dad time. You got to do what you got to do. And then what are you going to build? You know, um, so to step out and start to build something for yourself, I think is uh, very honorable. So that's a that's a cool thing to do, man. So uh, my hats, my hats off to you in that. So, um, man, well, you know, I think uh, I have I've hammered through questions here. I think that's all the questions I have for you, man. Anything else, you know, as far as it goes for. Uh, the investing, uh, the investing side of things, the taking bigger shots at brokerage deals, man. Is there any uh, anything else on your mind you wanted to add as flavor to the to the show today? You know, I ever since I made the jump, I've had a lot of younger folks reach out to me who are just getting in the business, um, asking me what what they should do, how, how do they put themselves on the right path, and what's been sort of the, the recurring piece of advice that that I give people is just make yourself super uncomfortable. And and, and it's, you know, because in the beginning, you you don't have closings coming up. You don't have listings. It's really hard to have like a a daily barometer uh, of am I doing enough to to, to move the ball forward. And I I look back at different times earlier in my career where where I made myself super uncomfortable. And and a lot of the times were flops that they weren't like big wins, but, but it was the... The, the t- tenacity that, that gets built by, by going out and making yourself uncomfortable um, is what puts you in the position that when that big opportunity comes along, you're razor sharp, you know, yeah. and, and you, your setbacks are productive. It, it doesn't feel productive in the moment, you know, when you have a deal blow up on you that you've been working on for six months. But th- there's little puzzle pieces that you'll learn from that that will put you in a position to, to, to knock down the big deal when the opportunity comes up. So yeah. uh, I, I would say sort of just go out and fail and make yourself uncomfortable and, and 
you know, that, that would be my brokerage advice. Um, investing advice, I would say just get started. That, that it's, I, I was five years into the business before I bought my first deal. And um, I didn't know what I was doing then. And I didn't know I was doing it for a few years before that. So I, I, yeah. I think it's, it's always going to seem too expensive. And it's always going to seem that you're biting off too much. But uh, if you wait for the perfect deal that makes you completely comfortable, it'll be 20 years. Um, yeah. And that with... Uh, with appreciation and with compounding returns, it's, I mean, I, the, the first deal I bought went up 50% in less than a year. So yeah. it's, I would just say, get started early. You have this real estate leaves you such a comfortable margin to make mistakes versus other investing vehicles that, that it's, uh, just get started. Yeah. No, that's super good advice, man. Um, man, Eric, thank you so much for coming on. And uh, before you go, man, where can people find you? Where can people connect with you? I know you're on LinkedIn, uh, have a good presence there, but any other social platforms? Yeah, or, I, I, I would say LinkedIn is the best way to get in touch with me. Um, people can, can email me, uh, eric at yoko.com. Um, easy to find. And um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to, to give free advice to, 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 to people who, who are looking for it. Um, yeah. No, and that and that's helpful, man. There's a lot of younger people in the space, and uh, you've done incredibly well in this business. So I know that's that's very very helpful today. So um, awesome, man. Well, thanks so much for coming on today, and thank you everybody for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. All right.